Halo, halo. Dzień dobry. E, możemy się jakoś zbić bardziej tak w, w kupę bliżej? Nie trzeba siadać z tyłu, nie będziemy gryźć. Bardzo. No chyba, że ktoś bardzo się upiera, żeby z tyłu siedzieć, no to okej, okay, nie? Jeszcze chwileczkę musimy poczekać. Windows się odpala. Tak, w ramach takiego małego wstępu. Ja jestem Grzegorz Adamowicz. Jestem wiceprezesem Szczecińskiej Grupy Użytkowników Linuxa i Unixa. I jesteśmy tutaj organizatorem tej konferencji. Jeszcze mam nadzieję, że troszkę więcej ludzi się zajdzie, że może poczekamy te 5 minut.
Okay, so I'm going to switch to English. Uh, not, not. Uh, we are still waiting for for our uh, friends from uh, CCC from Germany, <laughs> but I hope they will be here soon. Okay, so thank you for coming uh, to uh, Open Source Conference. I'm Greg. I'm uh, vice vice president of uh, Szczecin Linux Unix uh, Users Group, and uh, I'm glad to um, show you some uh, great people uh, from uh, our town as well as from uh, uh, Germany. Okay, I'm going to give uh, you uh, one of our partners. Uh, from uh, Pomeranian uh, Technology Park. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Witkowska. I'm representing Pomerania Techno Park. We are uh, here in Szczecin since uh, 1999, and we are a business support organization. Held here in Szczecin, we are uh, devoted to support startups and SMEs in ICT sector. Uh, mainly by organizing for them many activities holding like uh, some business consultancy, law, accounting, many, many marketing and PR activities, so mainly as one of these is the, the uh, today event. I think it's fair to conference organized by Technopark together with, uh, with Schluck. Uh, we've met uh, three years ago and uh, I met uh, Tom Lee them and I knew that we have to cooperate with organizations like this um, because you are uh, people who love and enjoy technologies and uh, ICT so we have to um, cooperate with, uh, with people like you and uh, try to organize common projects and I hope that today event is the not last one and uh, in a near future we will uh, organize together bigger projects, not only conference and events and workshops, but also uh, might be some R&D projects. So I wish you pleasant talk today and tomorrow at the conference and nice stay here in Szczecin in the evening. And hopefully uh, we will have a, a nice cooperation in, uh, in the future. So uh, I invite you to Technopark Pomerania to, to cooperation with us, with ICT West Pomerania Cluster, an association which we have, uh, in which we have 60, almost 60 SMEs, uh, mainly local comp small companies from Szczecin. And with Schluck also, with Foundation Endcamp, uh, Robert Crow is also with us today. Uh, Agis, Michał Smarczyński, somewhere, somewhere at the back, yeah. Uh, so, nice to have you here and I wish you a pleasant conference today. Thank you. Okay, so let's get cracking. Uh, first is uh, Joanna Muras. She will talk uh, about uh, Alfresco. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, nice to see that a lot of people uh, join us in uh, well, our uh, common effort to make a world better place, right, and uh, support open source. Uh, maybe uh, I should mention that I feel much better coding than speaking. So excuse me if. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, if uh, well, I, I'm not uh, so uh, expressing myself so well, but I try to do my best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, I start with a few words about myself. Um, I come from Szczecin. Uh, I graduated from Technical University. Uh, now it's actually uh, yeah. Now it changed the name. Uh, and then I actually uh, I left our country and I went to Ireland and I s actually I did my PhD there in computer science. Uh, I work professionally. I'm Java programmer, 
and so I work a few years there and then I decided to come back. Um, and here we are. Uh, I started to work uh, on Alfresco about a year ago. So it's not that I have so much experience. Uh, but still, uh, after a year, uh, I'm able to say a few things about the system. So uh, let's start. What's uh, Alfresco? So uh, Alfresco is open source product basically to manage documents in the company, like in few words, really. Uh, well, obviously, it's much more, and we are going to find out what else we can do. So, uh, where actually Alfresco can be applied? So, first is knowledge management. So, even small companies, if they hire few people, uh, there is always problem with uh, basically communication and uh, how to share knowledge between people. And Alfresco can help with that. So um, it, it has the mechanisms like a wiki, well, and uh, a few more mechanisms that, that supports basically sharing information between employees. Then obviously it's document management system. So um, every company, even small one, has a lot of documents. And collaboration on the project obviously also involves using a lot of documents. So. Uh, well, without such a system, uh, usually what happens is that people are going, are taking the documents, making changes, and then sending them back uh, using email. So at some stage, we have a lot of emails with some versions of the documents that we cannot really track where is the latest version and who did the changes and what's the status of the document really. So Alfresco basically helps us dealing with that. So everyone, everything is stored in one place, and we can review the, the, which document version it is and who did the changes. So we can be pretty safe that we have the latest version of the document so we don't waste our time working on something that is not really up to date. Uh, then we have shared drive replacement. So basically, uh, Alfresco supports SIPs, uh, which uh, enables it to, to work as a shared drive. So under Windows, it's, it's basically as another folder on uh, our desktop. So without any problems, we can um, move folders back and forth. And that's what Alfresco supports. Uh, then we have enterprise portals and intranets. So Basically, it can be used as a um, portal for the employees. It has, for example, dashboard. So on, on the dashboard, uh, we can, there is a mechanism that allows to create dashlets. So depending on what information we want uh, people within the company to see, uh, we can either use existing uh, dashlets, which few of them uh, are provided with our fresco, or we can obviously implement our own. So like here we have really great flexibility. So depending on the user type, we can show uh, different types of information, for example. So it's really flexible. Uh, then we have web content management. So we can also use Alfresco for uh, managing, obviously, simple websites that uh, won't be really uh, sophisticated one, but simple uh, websites and uh, mostly the, the content of, of the websites, really, so the documents that are there. Um, then information publishing. So it's basically related to well, also to the, to the websites, but not necessarily. We can choose the place where actually the documents uh, should be uplo uploaded uh, after, for example, reviewing them. Obviously, we can decide when we want to upload the documents. Uh, so we have also mechanisms that, that support that. Uh, then records management. So uh, it's actually certified by US government uh, certification. I, I don't remember really the number, sorry for that. But if you uh, are interested in that, I, I'm happy to, to give you that information later on. Uh, so basically, it allows to define rules for document management. So when the document is first uploaded to Alfresco until the document is removed from Alfresco, right? 
Okay, and then we have uh, case management. So basically, it allows us to to define different rules depending on the documents and depending on much more factors. Uh, so, for example, uh, we we decide that the documents that have certain extension should be always uh, moved to some particular folder. So, uh, Alfresco allows us to. Uh, deal with such a case. Okay, so uh, let's move forward. Uh, uh, that's the architecture. So uh, maybe let's start from the bottom. Uh, so we have storage. Uh, so uh, there are two types of storage uh, in Alfresco. Uh, one is database storage and one is file system. So when the document is uploaded, Right, uh, it's actually stored in the file system. Uh, well, the the name is changed, and the folder structure obviously it's some particular folder structure, uh, but still it is physical on some hard drive. Uh, and then, uh, on the top of that, of course, we have database. So database contains all the information that are first related to the. <coughs> documents within Alfresco, so it contains information about the uh, document metadata, because Alfresco allows us to define metadata for the documents, we'll, I will talk about that later on, uh, and obviously all the permissions and all the additional stuff that it's necessary for Alfresco to, to operate. Uh, then we have uh, Alfresco core, right, so that's what where really the repository is. So uh, on top of content repository, which is uh, responsible obviously for storing uh, the documents, uh, we have content services. Uh, so basically content services are all the services related to um, content, right? So for example, the metadata uh, of the documents. Uh, we are allowed, to, well, we can access them uh, and use them depending obviously on what we want to achieve. Uh, then we have control services. So control services involve, uh, for example, workflows. Uh, Alfresco allows to define workflows. Uh, so define few steps that uh, the document should go through before, for example, is uploaded to the web page. Uh, it also has a mechanism to, to define the workflows so we can Depending on our needs, obviously, we can uh, just uh, implement one of them. And then the collaboration services that I mentioned, so the wiki, and uh, it has actually some uh, integration with Facebook, uh, I think. And, uh, and so that's the core. And on top of that, we have uh, clients. So obviously, we need some user interface in most cases to, to, to access the system. So <clears throat> at the moment, Alfresco provides two uh, user interfaces. One is Alfresco Explorer, <clears throat> which was actually the, the first one, and it <clears throat> went with initial versions of Alfresco. But uh, it wasn't so great. Uh, that's why uh, Alfresco Share uh, is basically replacing it. Uh, so. Um, Alfresco Share, its application, uh, well, it's just the front end, really. And it <clears throat> communicates with the core using REST web services. So it can be deployed on a separate machine and uh, have nothing in common with the content repository. Like, it can be configured just to talk to particular repository. And then the, the things that I mentioned uh, before, so the... Uh, records management, document management, uh, no web content management, and that one was I forgot what was that really, <laughs> but yeah, one of those I, I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, okay, oh, that way. Okay, so the content repository, as I mentioned, Alfresco is really content repository, so. Uh, here we have uh, more things that uh, that really uh, Alfresco supports. So uh, to start with, we have definition of content structure and model, really. So um, 
depending obviously on our needs, we can uh, we can implement well or define actually that's better word because the model is XML file really. Uh, we can define uh, define sorry uh, the, um, the properties, for example, of, of the documents that, that we want to have. So, if we assume, that, okay, maybe I should start um, yeah, from other end. So basically, um, in general, Alfresco, uh, everything in Alfresco is a node, and each node has to have a type. So there are different types of nodes. So for example, there are folders, there are users, there are there is content. So the, there is few types defined. And obviously the the uh, Alfresco allows us to define our own types that we are going to use in a particular way. And each type has a set of properties uh, and set of associations. So uh, the, the properties also we can define depending on our needs. So for example, if we have users in our fresco and we want each user to have uh, metadata like location, we, we can just define it and then use it as we go along. Uh, then um, and the associations, right? So we can say that one type of nodes is related to other type of nodes. Um, so that's more or less modeling. Uh, the, the, the mechanism is really flexible, so it also supports inheritance. So we can just extend one type a little bit to, to tweak it to, to do what we want, really. Uh, then, obviously, it allows us to create, modify, and delete content and associate metadata and relationships. So I think it's like pretty clear <laughs> what it does. Uh, then obviously querying the content, uh, that's a big feature because uh, uh, it, allow, it, it, it allows uh, search of the information. So we can either search uh, the documents depending on the metadata and also we can search uh, the documents, uh, like full text search is supported by Alfresco. So depending what is in document actually, we can try to find it. Uh, then access control uh, on content, so permissions. So basically, the, each user or set of users has uh, some certain permissions that obviously we can tweak depending on what we need. So we have users and we have groups. So users can belong to groups and then we can either give permissions to some particular group of users or uh, on the user basis. So it's really up to us. There are a few types of permissions, uh, but yeah, maybe uh, I will not go into so much detail, but basically uh, we can also, uh, we, well, we can use whatever is in Alfresco, or we can also actually change them, the, the, the permission types uh, to, to suit our needs. Uh, then we have versioning of content, which is quite important feature when we work on, on, on projects, right? Because the documents go back and forth, back and forth, and, <laughs> uh, and then at some stage we don't know what's happening. So uh, the, the versioning of the content using that feature, we can see uh, the version from the very start of the, the versions of the, from the very start of, of the document till uh, the latest version, and we can see who actually made the changes. Uh, then we have content renditions. That, that's actually also a quite cool feature because it allows us to, to change one type of the document to another. So for example, when we upload the documents and it's a Word document, uh, it can be uh, converted to PDF. So user can then view it as PDF, which uh, in some cases may be something that is desired. Uh, well, here the, some of the of the renditions so they are defined, right? But uh, we can also write our own plugins to to convert one type of the document to another. So it's also configurable. Uh, so if some type is not supported, we can basically uh, 
take some library that supports the transformation from one type to another and write a plugin and it will be done. Uh, then locking, so obviously we can uh, lock the node so, so no one can modify it as we do the changes, uh, which is sometimes quite important. Events, so basically um, we are notified uh, when something changes in, in the system. Uh, audits, so we can view what was done and who did it. Uh, import and export of the data, right? Which as a repository is probably quite common to start with. Uh, then uh, it supports many languages, uh, so uh, the they are basically, the, there's a lot of translation files. So if we feel that, uh, well, something is not really uh, well translated or, or we need to add additional language, it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, Polish is there, by the way. And uh, rules and actions. Uh, so what we can do, we can define our own actions. So actions would be, for example, move one folder to another, or uh, delete user, or, or whatever. And then we can say that, for example, if, so that would be action, and then we can define the rule on the action. So we can say that, for example, if uh, the document is uploaded to particular folder, uh, then run some action. So for example, to mark is at at some additional metadata then, for example. But it's also entirely up to us uh, what we are going to do with that. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, part of that uh, I mentioned before. So uh, that's how Alfresco is built, really. So we have a node, and the each node has some type, and each node can have properties. And uh, the property also is uh, defined using some type. So it can be either text or it can be um, number or whatever type uh, we decide. Uh, and then, um, yeah, obviously, it's uh, if we can put some constraints on the values uh, taken by the property. So uh, then, obviously, user will not allow to, to, to put other values than we defined that are possible for that particular property. And uh, then we can also relate to node to another node. So that's this association part. So we can say that, for example, user is related to some website. And both of uh, website and the user, there are nodes. And the, there is just link between them. Uh, so search. I, I mentioned that uh, Alfresco allows to, to do search. Uh, so we can do search in a few ways. Uh, basically. Um, Either we can search metadata, uh, so basically the, the properties of some particular document or folder or another data type like a user. Uh, then we can uh, search the documents depending on the path under, each, under which it is in the repository. Or we can do full text search, which is really cool feature. Uh, for full text search, actually, uh, Lucene um, Mm, library is used. Uh, so um, in previous ver versions of Fresco, I, I think the Lucene was only library that supported search. Well, the, and in new versions, it's still the, the, the library still is the same. But on top of that, is actually built. Uh, Alfresco uses Solar, so that that's something more than just library. It's service. So. It can run on another machine because indexing uh, of the data can be really time consuming. Uh, so it can run on another machine and basically just communicate uh, with Alfresco to return search results. And obviously, any combinations of above, right? Okay. So uh, the protocols uh, that Alfresco supports. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have SIFs. 
So that's for shared drive. Uh, then we have WebDAV, uh, which uh, allows to access the repository using web browser. FTP, obviously, IMAP. Uh, it also, uh, yeah, because Alfresco allows sending emails and uh, receiving emails. And then Microsoft SharePoint, so it allows also uh, integration with that. So uh, here are resources uh, if someone is interested in more information. Uh, so, um, yeah. And a uh, few, few more words about the source code, because that's the interesting part. Uh, the, so the project started in November 2006, and uh, now it has over 2 million line of code, lines of code. Sorry. Uh, so it's, well, the coding ever was estimated more or less for 570 workdays, which is a lot. And uh, it has over 370 libra external libraries. Uh, most of them are open source. And uh, it's written in, in Java and in JavaScript, depending on, on part of it. But basically, there are two languages that are used uh, by Alfresco. And uh, it has, uh, obviously, several libraries or frameworks are, are used within. So it's Spring, Hibernate, Hibernate Ibates, Rhino as a JavaScript engine, and Solar Info for text search. So uh, before questions, maybe uh, I would like to show you actually how it works. Because uh, talking like sometimes picture is more than 200 words, or 100, 1,000 1, words. <laughs> so uh, OK, can I excuse you? So let's have a look how it OK, so basically, uh, that's how. Uh, Alfresco looks like uh, when you first log into it. Uh, so that's user dashboard. So once we click on my dashboard, uh, we can basically see that it consists from uh, consists from uh, dashlets. So uh, those are dashlets. Uh, obviously, those are standard dashlets that we can see right now, but um, we can also write our own dashlets. Uh, so, OK. Then uh, we have sites. So uh, the site is something that is like, it, it can be per project, for example. So for each project, we are going to have a site that allows to keep us all the documentation uh, related to it there. So let's create a new site to see how it works. So the name, well, let's call it Schluck. Oy, oy, oy. Hmm? Well done. OK. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, so uh, yeah. So yeah, it takes a while, depending on the machine, obviously. So, uh, so as we can see, we are on that side now. Uh, we can actually add it to favorites, uh, so we can have quick access to it. And then that site site board site dashboard. Sorry. So uh, it's something different from the user dashboard. But it also allows to define the dashlets. Uh, obviously, their information related to site would be rather than, than to the user. So um, we can customize uh, each dashboard. So each well, dashboard also, but each site. Um, and we can, apart from document library, which keeps all the documents, uh, we can also add some other tools, collaboration tools, like wiki, or the links, or data lists, and block. So it's up to us, really. But let's come back. So 
let's go to document library and we'll try to upload some document to see how it looks right it takes a while uh, so um, Okay, so maybe let's, uh, in the meanwhile, <laughs> uh, hopefully it loads, uh, uh, in the meanwhile I'll tell more about the users, right? So the users, as I mentioned, uh, they can be uh, managed, uh, well, they can be managed and put to different groups. Uh, so depending on that, we can give different permissions either to the content or actually we can allow only certain users to see uh, the site and the rest of the users should have no access to it then so but it should be actually better visible when we have a look at the document once we upload it yeah, I take some particular some standard windows picture yeah the connection seems to be pretty slow unfortunately Okay, so after a document upload, that's what we can do with the document, right? Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we have a few options uh, that actually uh, I'll extend uh, once the page load. Okay, maybe I can do it now here, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so basically what we'll see in a minute, hopefully, uh, is a few, few basically information that are related to each document. So one of that is going to be document properties. So the metadata that we can define for uh, the documents. Uh, then what else we'll be able to see is permissions. Uh, so right. So the properties. Let's start with the properties. So here are basically the properties of, of the document. So, as you can see, uh, well, because actually it was the image, uh, Alfresco detected that it was the image and it actually took some uh, related metadata and filled out appropriate fields. So, for example, like image width and image height. Uh, the mechanism actually to, to add additional data that, because uh, what we can do, we can define aspects in our fresco. Aspect is some particular set of properties that can be applied on the document. And then it's, we are not really restrained by the document type then. We, because many document types can have some particular aspects applied. So once we uh, have a look at manage aspects, we'll see that there is actually a lot of aspects that can be applied uh, on the document and the aspects can contain the properties, right? Or it, they can be used, for example, for search or it can be used for other purposes. So, for example, we can uh, define aspect uh, not downloadable. 
uh, in alfresco and then on that basis change or implement that kind of feature that will not allow any user to download the document, only view that within the repository. So here is sets of aspects um, that are, well, out of the box alfresco aspects. Uh, so after actually, after document, well, image was uploaded, we can see that aspects related to, to additional metadata uh, was applied on it, so it's here. But we can also add, for example, versionable aspects. And in that way, our uh, documents will be uh, versioned. So we'll be able to, after upload new document, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to change its version. And then, obviously, see all the previous versions uh, that were there before. Or, so, yeah. Maybe that's enough about the aspects. Uh, so, okay, uh, so the properties, as I mentioned, uh, the permissions. So, we can also change uh, permissions uh, to the document, and we can do it either on document basis or on folder basis. Uh, so, uh, permissions can be also inherited. So, for example, all the documents in some particular folder will inherit folder uh, permissions. So, um, Alfresco allows to define roles, and role is basically some set of permissions that uh, the document uh, has, right? So, um, that's what we can see now here, really. So, there are standard roles within Alfresco which are actually site administrator, contributor, consumer, and collaborator. Obviously, they have different types of roles. Uh, so we can then to, we can give particular user some role. Once user is actually becoming member of the site, it always has to have some role defined. So uh, then, obviously, under that roles, we are going to have groups of users. And then, for particular role, we can give particular privileges, like, as we can see now. So, well, obviously, maybe it's not so great how it looks, because contributors have contributor privileges. It's kind of um, obvious. But what we can do uh, is, for example, to say that only collaborators should have some kind of privileges, and all the user, other users should have no privileges. So after we are going to set it like this, uh, oh, sorry, no, that. Uh, then only actually users that are collaborators in particular site, because obviously uh, for each site it's like sites are separate. So um, user can be collaborator in one site and consumer in another. So in that particular site, uh, only collaborators will be able to see the content. Okay, then we have also uh, workflows. So the, as I said before, we can start uh, on each document. Uh, well, not necessarily even document, but in general, we can start. Uh, we can have workflows. But okay, okay, another one, perfect. Uh, so, for example, the uh, review and approve workflow. So, we assume that uh, well, it should work after clicking. But for some reason, it doesn't. Uh, so, uh, what should happen now? And it didn't. Okay, now it did. Uh, so, we have few fields, obviously, to fill in. Uh, and then we have document attached uh, that should be reviewed, and uh, we can start workflow uh, on that basis. So each workflow actually, yeah, I will just put some data to show you uh, the workflow uh, diagram. Sorry. 
So, okay, that should be enough. Okay, no, it works. Uh, so, um, let's have a look at the workflow. Uh, each workflow obviously consists of Uh, right? Okay, it works. Uh, so, uh, let's actually have a look at the...
Uh, yes. Uh, so basically what you can do within the workflow is um, you have few steps. So um, yeah, I'm not able to sh sh show the diagram because it was pretty slow. Uh, but as each workflow, obviously, we, we define some tasks. And then the, the tasks, uh, actually, within the workflow, to, for each task, the, there is the configuration of the form that should be rendered to the user when user actually access that tasks. So that's uh, one thing. Uh, apart from that, of, apart from user task, we have also service task. So they can be automatic. So obviously, whatever we decide to do. So for example, the task would be to copy folder somewhere or to send email or something like this. So that would be that. And obviously, apart from the view that that user can see w within the user tasks, we can also obviously define some logic that would, for example, uh, just uh, assign tasks to a particular users group or do some other stuff on, on the top of that during that step. Anyone else? <coughs> no? OK, so thank you guys who, uh, for coming. Actually, it's called Friday morning. <laughs> Pretty sure it would be nicer to stay in bed. But that's great that you are here. And thank you very much. If you have any questions later on, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. OK. Uh, so we can take a break right now. Um, the next uh, speech is scheduled on uh, 10.30, so we have about 15 minutes. Uh, you can go uh, outside this uh, room on, on uh, my right side, your left, and there is uh, some snacks and drinks. See you after the break.
So, okay. Are we back, everyone? It's old a problem with uh, batteries all the time. Okay, so we have uh, a little surprise for you. We have special guest here right now, uh, the president of Szczecin. Uh, please. Witam wszystkich bardzo, bardzo serdecznie. Cieszę się, że mogę wpaść na chwilę tutaj na waszą konferencję. You are all welcome most heartily and I am so happy that I have been able to come uh, at least for a while uh, to visit you at this conference. Przede wszystkim chciałem pogratulować organizatorom, bo wiem, że to już są cykliczne spotkania. To jest bardzo ważne, bo w ogóle branża IT dla Szczecina i dla polskiej gospodarki ma ogromne znaczenie. Um, as I know, uh, this is a kind of regular um, subsequent meeting. Therefore, I would like to uh, thank you for organizing and all the organizing uh, organizers to organize such a meeting, which is the next one and i would like to emphasize that it as you all know is one of the impo most important branches uh, for uh, economy for industry for all of us w szczecinie doskonale zdajemy sobie sprawę z tego że branża it to jest ta branża która w ciągu najbliższych paru lat powinna stać się jedną z najważniejszych gałęzi naszej gospodarki in Szczecin we are fully aware of the fact and we realize this fact that the IT branch uh, is, uh, is going to become one of the major branches for our uh, development, economic development and industry in the near future. Cały czas mamy świadomość, że miejsc pracy w tej branży w Szczecinie jest proporcjonalnie jeszcze cały czas mało do, w porównaniu do tych ośrodków wiodących w naszym kraju, a więc przed nami z tego powodu duże wyzwanie. Uh, we are uh, aware of the fact that in our region there are not so many uh, jobs uh, relating to IT profile uh, in comparison to biggest centers in other parts of Poland. So there are great challenges uh, awaiting us in this field. Stąd takie działania w Szczecinie, jak choćby park naukowo-technologiczny, a więc takie miejsce, które ma sprzyjać rozwojowi, szczególnie tych nowych pomysłów zgłaszanych przez najmłodszych przedstawicieli tej branży. And it is therefore that such places as Technopark have been created, which are to create favorable conditions for development, especially for the youngest people that shall be educated in this field. Musimy zadbać, żeby wspólnie zadbać tutaj w naszym regionie i myślę też o przestrzeni transgranicznej, aby ta branża mogła się rozwijać, aby mogła uzyskiwać środki zewnętrzne w kolejnej perspektywie unijnej, aby mogła być branżą strategiczną dla naszego województwa, bo możliwości kreatywne są u nas ogromne. Wiemy też, że ta przestrzeń w branży IT jest tak szeroka i tak niewyobrażalna, że tak naprawdę dzisiaj nie wiemy, co się wydarzy za dwa lata, ale wiemy na pewno, że bez technologii, tej wysokiej technologii, praktycznie już nie potrafimy żyć. What we know for sure uh, that the IT technology is something so wide and something difficult to imagine uh, that we know that we cannot live without it anymore. 
Therefore, we have to make efforts and to do our best in order to try to win uh, the um, programs and funds, uh, especially in the perspective of European Union, uh, which will permit us uh, to develop even more and to, uh, to uh, become uh, the leaders, if not, uh, maybe it is not exactly what has been said, but the sense is like this, uh, that uh, we have to take care and to make efforts to work jointly and to try to win the resources jointly. Dlaczego to dla nas jest takie ważne w Szczecinie? Bo każde miejsce pracy w branży IT to jest zwykle miejsce dobrze opłacane, to są podatki, to są ludzie aktywni, których tutaj potrzebujemy po to, żeby się rozwijać. Uh, which is particularly important and which should be emphasized. Uh, we know that the jobs uh, relating to this IT uh, technology uh, involves uh, well payable, well uh, payable jobs. Uh, so it means also development of both pro pro uh, professional uh, and per personal profits and economical for the whole region. Therefore, it's very profitable to invest in uh, this field of uh, technology uh, and knowledge. Cały czas brakuje nam dobrych specjalistów i dlatego też potrzebne są działania miasta w przestrzeni edukacji choćby. I tutaj w Szczecinie w tej chwili rozpoczynamy, już rozpoczęliśmy programy informatyczne dla najmłodszych Szczecinian, nawet w szkołach podstawowych, po to, żeby przyzwyczajali się do programowania, do nie tylko korzystania z komputera jako narzędzia do gry, ale również do szukania jako instrumentu do rozwiązywania pewnych problemów. I ten program będziemy mocno poszerzali już od pierwszej klasy szkoły podstawowej, bo dzisiaj to robimy dla dzieci trochę starszych. Natomiast co jest jeszcze bardzo ważne, to to, że już od września tego roku ruszą dodatkowe programy w Szczecinie nauki przedmiotów ścisłych. Chodzi o matematykę i fizykę głównie po to, żeby ta baza osób, z których można e, zaczerpnąć e, na uczelnie techniczne, na uczelnie informatyczne, po prostu była większa. What is really very important is the emphasis to be laid on education of young people, uh, especially in those, uh, in such uh, strict fields as mathematics, physics, uh, IT. Uh, therefore, we've been teaching Uh, very uh, young children at their schools within special programs uh, which are intended for creating in, this, uh, in all these young people uh, the knowledge and the habit to learn, to program, to become well educated and then uh, it means well prepared for future jobs. Um, this is more or less. Jeszcze jedna uwaga bardzo ważna, mianowicie cały czas zauważamy i na tym poziomie państwa i na poziomie młodzieży, że to zainteresowanie informatyką w sensie programowania, ono jest jednak większe wśród panów niż wśród pań. I stąd będziemy też preferowali w szkołach takie programy, które będą skierowane do dziewczynek, do tych, które jakby na dzisiaj w mniejszym stopniu się tym interesują. Uważamy, że warto by było wesprzeć te działania, które wprowadzą do tego systemu inteligentnego programowania, nie tylko korzystania, właśnie jak największą ilość kobiet. What is particularly noticeable is the lack of women, of girls in this field. It is not so popular yet, therefore we want to put emphasis on uh, teaching um, children, especially female uh, schoolboys and schoolgirls, in order that they would also become professional. Uh, therefore, there will be special programs involved, involving higher share of uh, female participants uh, taking part in this. A więc sporo wyzwań, wyzwań przed nami. Myślę, że będziemy starali się im podobać w tych najbliższych latach, tak żeby Szczecin był w czołówce nie tylko polskich, ale i europejskich miast w branży IT. Będziemy naprawdę robili wszystko, żeby te warunki były jak najlepsze i nasza współpraca, żeby też układała się jak najlepiej. My ją dzisiaj chwalimy i cenimy, bo środowisko jest naprawdę aktywne, 
i pośród tych branż gospodarczych, z którymi ja się spotykam, muszę powiedzieć, że najwięcej kreatywnych, fajnych pomysłów i najmniej pretensja, najwięcej właśnie pomysłów jest właśnie w branży, w branży IT. Uh, I would like to emphasize, I'm starting from the end, uh, I, uh, that the biggest number of ideas and creative, uh, creative attitudes uh, is in the IT uh, branch. Uh, therefore, um, there are a lot of challenges awaiting us and we can promise that we shall do our best in order to provide and to create favorable conditions so as young people could become educated and that could make us leaders not only uh, in the Polish perspective but also in comparison to uh, other people in uh, European Union and other countries. I na koniec oczywiście życzę jak najwięcej satysfakcji z tego dzisiejszego i jutrzejszego spotkania. Dziękuję bardzo. Uh, and I would like to wish you a lot of satisfaction uh, arising out of this meeting taking place today and tomorrow. And I am sorry if I not I have not translated everything, but the president was speaking so quickly. You have understood everything, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that we have been uh, no noticed and you got the time uh, to come here. So we have Max. I can uh, give you one and. Uh, <laughs> One second. And this little gifts. Okay. okay. So uh, I think that we can go back to our schedule right now. Uh, uh, so uh, now Jennifer will uh, tell us about uh, Android security. Uh, but first, I have uh, a, a little uh, numbers I, ha I have found uh, rec recently. Uh, there are 28.6% uh, uh, installations of ice cream sandwich. It's uh, uh, release uh, of Android in version 403 and 404 which was uh, released in uh, 20, 2011 and uh, uh, some of you probably know it is uh, quite old right now. Uh, let's move on. There are uh, two jelly beans for one and for two and uh, uh, it's 14 and 1.6% of uh, installation right now, respectively. And I think that you know that there are uh, more than uh, 20 million installations yeah, of Android. So uh, the impact of uh, this presentation, I think it will be huge. So uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for inviting me and let's dive into the droid world. Short about myself, um, I'm a researcher working at Rocurity Labs in Berlin, Germany and I'm mostly working on the MobBomb project. The MobBomb project is a project um, I will go on the next slide and um, I'm interested in IT security as a whole in the topic. I'm interested in reverse engineering and Android and mobile computing in general. Mm, you can reach me via Java or via email or if you want to reach me, you can ask me later for a card. I can give you one. Um, Mobworm is a research project funded by the BMBF. This is the German Ministry for Education and Research. And we try to find new ways to prevent mobile malware find out about new ways of infecting mobile malware and putting all this together, make, making tools and writing good papers. <laughs> First, um, due to the moment of time, I don't have enough time to tell you all about Android security. I will only give you an introduction on how to secure your applications you are writing. 
because I think this is the this will give you the most power. It's much more interesting for you than I will tell you how how malware is working or something like that. I I, I do not know if you can take this for for something, but I think to know how to secure your applications, this is a skill that everybody can make good from it. So why do we care about security? Um, like it was said, Android phones are extremely popular. Nearly, I think in this room, at least every second people had an Android phone in this pocket. So the devices are designed to be always on. This means the devices are designed to be always on the internet via Wi-Fi or via 3G or 4G. And if vulnerabilities arise that are exploited, who fails? Sorry for, the, for saying, but it's the programmer. So let's do what we can to, do to secure our apps properly and correctly so that we don't have this impact if something went wrong. So not a little more about the motivation. In the last year, I found these headlines in newspapers and on the internet. I think if, you can, if you're reading it, it will um, show you what I mean, how important this topic is. So let's go to the security model. Um, Android is a multi-user is a multi-user system, except only one user is using it because every application has its own user with its own UID. There are exceptions who will come to later, but for the first time or for general, every application has its own UAD and this is, it is running. UADO, the root UAD, is not given if, if your phone is not rooted. So please be aware of rooting your phone because if you root the phone, every application is running under root UAD. No application is running under normal UAD anymore you will exploit the whole sandbox concept if you root your system. And on Android, we have a lightweight um, virtual machine. It's, it's a register-based machine. It's called the Dalvik VM. It's a little like the Java and runtime environment where you can execute bytecode and so on. Every Android application must be signed. The .apk or in uppercase letters APK means an Android application. This is how it is um, called. And everyone, every, everything has to be assigned. So the signature identifies the developer. So every signature identifies yourself. This is like an ID card to you if you have one. You can use self-signed certificates, and there are two differences, main differences between certificates. You have one certificate for debug reasons. This is not accepted if you want to upload your application to some market later. For this reason, especially for the Play Store, you need a release key, and this release key is accepted, and then you can release your um, application to the Play Store and everybody can download it and use it. As I told, told before, um, sharing a UID is possible, but you have to define this, especially in your Android manifest to do so. It looks like this, android.shared user ID and then com example punk test shared UID and the shared UID is a placeholder for the UID you will share. And you can also do this programmatically. It looks like this that you receive the packet that you start the packet manager, receive the packet info and then get out the UID that it is using and then you will share it. And what is most important about to know about sharing a UID, it is only possible within 
if the application is signed with the same key. So the applications that should share the UIDs, the both applications or three, have all been written from, from myself or from my development group that is using my release key. Process separation on Android is um, like the same. An application has a UID and one PID, but more PIDs are possible so that we can see one for for one application, more PIDs are possible, but for more than one application to share a PID is impossible. So as we can see, activity one, activity is a um, component of an Android um, package. Um, the first activity has PID one, the second activity, the other component has PID two. This is possible. And this is also done within the menu, in the Android manifest. And herefore we have the Android dot, um, colon process com and the process ID tag we can use. So other components from components from other applications, as I told, can share the PID. But if you have your PID um, split it for your application, it is a very good way to prevent the whole application from being dust or something like that, because the part of the application that runs under its separate PID can crash without affecting the whole application. So if you have one service or one activity or one part of an application running separated with an own PID, it, and it crashes, not the whole application is crashing. Yeah, and we have the option to run this, the same um, components from different packages with the same PID only if we share a UID before. This is, yeah. And if you are doing this, the name must start with a lowercase letter, the letter to, to be set global. So for short, um, normally it isn't possible to share a PID over more than one application with the same um, Without um, that, uh, normally it is not possible to share um, a PID with the same. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. Normally it is not possible to share a PID um, with different applications. It is only possible if you have more than one application written by yourself, signed with the same certificate, then you can declare using UID and PID together. But I recommend you not to do so. <laughs> then we have the file system isolation. Um, this is um, normally based on the UID, so um, normally based on the application itself. One application can't read the data of another application. The root UID, if you really want to root your phone, um, can bypass any permissions that are given. And external storage, like SD cards or something like that, um, lacks Android permission access. So everything that is stored on SD card, please keep in mind if you write applications, everything that is stored on your SD card can be written by every application because there is no permission check for data on the SD card. And um, on files, if you generate files, you can specify permissions, different permissions on the file, and I will go to this soon. So you have um, the file system permission flex. This is mode private. More private means no other application can write or read something from my application. Then we have more word readable. 
This means everybody can read it, but not write it. And we have mode, mode world writable. And the fun fact or the interesting fact of mode world writable is the difference to a normal Linux where I have, when I have writing permissions, I have also reading permissions. In Android, they skipped that. If you have writing permissions, you don't have reading permissions as default. You have to declare it specially that you want to have um, reading permis uh, writing permissions or, or readings permissions too. And here I have a simple um, sample code for generating um, a file that is world readable and world writable so everybody can read and write to it. And keep in mind, if you write an application, um, the principle of least privilege, please give only the privileges your application really needs for the data or other applications really needs the data, then give the privileges. If they don't need it, really need it, don't give the privileges, please. Then we have the shared preferences and the database isolation. Shared preferences is a special thing in Android. I only know it from there. And they have the same, you can give them the same permissions, then you give files. And preferences for a database are also the same. So preferences for shared permissions and for the database are also private, word writable, and word readable. And um, here's a sample code that tells you um, how, do, how to create a database normally and giving the database flags. This is um, the call open or create database. If you use the SQLite open helper, it will create every database with mode private permission. You can change this later, but not directly. Then we have permissions of Android of applications itself. They are defined in the Android manifest. I think you know what I mean with this um, permissions. This is permissions for using a, um, system APIs, for using Wi-Fi, or for using some other stuff like the phone book, something like that. And they must be granted before the app is installed. So if you if, if you won't accept it, your app will not install. I think everybody that has an Android phone knows what I mean. If you click on the market, you download an application, and then you see the screen where it says, and this application wants to read your network status, um, read incoming SMS, something like that. And you have to accept it. If you don't accept it, you can't install this application. On stock Android, it is not possible to revoke these permissions later. There are solutions for that. I know about some research in this direction that some um, a professor from a university told me shortly, but I don't really, sorry, I don't know, remember who it was on a conference that he's working on a program to re reject permissions after installing, but I don't know how far he's come with that. And Yeah, this is Cyan again mod seven. This is not stock Android. I'm only talking about the stock Android stuff. I know that this that there are some mechanisms in other Android flavor operating systems. But um yeah, my I will concentrate on the stock Android from Google so that we have one base because I don't think that everybody is running Cyan again mod. I I would I, w I would be pleased to see if much more people would run Cyanog in mod. <laughs> so what 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 is this all about? The UIDs, the PIDs, the system API permissions, and so on. If some attacker really really guts 
into the device and can run arbitrary code in your application context. He can normally, if you wrote a proper security root, securing routine, he can only run it in your application's context and can't go out. So this is why this is so important to understand the permissions, the UID model, and so on. Because if you don't accept the principle of least privilege and so on, it is very, very likely that an attacker that already found a vulnerability and exploited your application can break out of your application and do other bad stuff as well. And you don't want that. So we have categories of permissions. Um, the Android team enforced these categories some years ago. And normal permissions for API calls cannot um, impart real harm, and so they do not have to be accepted by the user, especially. But if you have the dialogue, they will be shown. So you can see the permission set wallpaper, for example, because for a set wallpaper can't do real harm to you. The worst thing that you will get is an, another wallpaper you don't want to. You can delete it and take your old, old, old wallpaper again. Then you have the category of dangerous. Dangerous means they can um, cause real harm. This is like network traffic or sending SMS or something like that. And they have to be reviewed by the user before installing and have to be accepted explicitly. Um, then there is another category. This is the signature. And this means when I have one application signed with my certificate, and another application assigned with my certificate. And my second application wants to make use of functions or methods in the first application for calling APIs. It will get it without asking again, because you already accepted this in the first time. The signature system thing is not really important for normal developers. This is um, for applications that are written by Google or by vendors from phones that really wants to, sh um, to that, that wants to um, make apps that work together seamlessly. So this is more for Samsung, HTC, or Google itself. You can declare custom permissions, and this is a really, really good way to secure your application. Um, and in this example, um, this is an example for an email program that can receive email and write email with. And um, in this case, I um, declared the custom permission, read incoming email. So this means um, when, I have another when, when I have another application that can show me an email, um, I can say that this application should get the permissions to show me the email too. So this application can get the email from that application. and. For this, you can check the permission. And this is done with um, the check calling permission flag um, method in your application itself. So if another application wants to read the incoming email from your application, you can check if it has the permission in this way. Check calling permission, and then the, um, the custom permission set and then a check. Um, if it's not um, granted, um, you can throw a security exception. So you can see it in the log file that something went wrong and potentially find out wh why this was going wrong. Mm, checking permissions based on packages or UAD is um, like that. Um, you can check it from code like this with a package. 
if you check for the package name as a whole. This means the whole fully qualified name, not only the package name like barcode scanner, you have to know the whole name, com developer dot edu dot barcode scanner or something like that, it is normally. Or you can check it um, if you know the UID and the PID. This, but I think this um, UID PID thing is not really good approach because um, it's very hard to find out and you will write a lot of code to get this done. So we have the application components. Um, normal Android applications um, consists of a manifest file, activities, services, broadcast receivers and intents. The activity is the UI that is shown to you as a user. I think a lot of you will know. And an app can start another app's activity. So if I have an application that is um, yeah, calculating my um, training outcomes or something for fitness. I can start with the fitness application, another application like um, a diet tracker that makes use of my diet and my fitness trainings to get a whole training stage. A service is working in the background normally. This is not a separate process and not a separate thread. It is only a component. It's, it's like an activity without a UI. So going back to the email um, example, when we look at the email example, we can say the downloading of the emails could be done in a service that is running in the background and you will be only notified if you need to be notified. So you don't see every you don't see every time a whole UI if you do something with your email. Then we have the broadcast receivers. They are listening for intents. Intents, I will um, come to it later in the next slide. And they are cre created dynamically in the Android manifest. And there are two types of broadcast. This is normal broadcast. They are working asynchronous, and they cannot be aborted because of the asynchronous type. Um, and they are other broadcasts. They are delivered serially. And because they are delivered serially to the intents, they can be aborted. And um, yeah, broadcast receivers can also be set up to listen to broadcast intents and directed intents. I will come to it later. How is this working? An intent is normally a request for a certain action to take place. It's like a system message, it's like um, I will tell you, oh, please let me know about Wi-Fi is turning on. Then you can declare a broadcast receiver that is getting the intent from the system that the Wi-Fi turned on. And the broadcast receiver can start some other activity after he received, hey, Wi-Fi is on, please do your job. This is a simple um, inter-process communication mechanism for Android applications. And it is used not only for inter-application communication, it is also used for inter-component communication. Every app can create intents too. It's not only system-based. I can write an app that says, um, make an intent if this and that is happening. and this message could be sent to special order apps or, like I told, as broadcast to the whole system. And the apps can think who can use it. Um, every intent can contain data, but normally the most intents are only con uh, containing the signal. Something happened. Please do something. But they can contain data like something happened and I now have the return value of please take it to that. 
every intern can start an, another activity or another component with start activity. Mm. Yeah, I told you this um, can be broadcast system wide. You have for that you have to send broadcast method. And um, normally they have two main components. This is the action, what happened, please tell me, and the data. The data is normally referred to in a URI, like HTTP, like content, like geo, like whatever. Normally it is some um, place on your file system, and there it is, URI, and your file system pass like data, application name, subfolder, next subfolder, foobar. Then we have the content providers. The content providers are not like an intent because they are not sent like this. They only provide content. They are not sent directed asynchronous or something like that. They are, aren't sent ever but they contain data in the same URI scheme as the interns before. Normally it is um, used as a front end, front end to, your, to your database. This is an SQLite database. And the authority name is declared um, a content provider and a manifest. So in the manifest you have to declare the content provider if you will have a content provider with, within your application. And every app can um, create an intent object that signifies that it wants a certain action to take place, like we said before. This is really important to know because this is one of the most important concepts of Android, to get to know how the components are working together and how can my application work together with other applications. Because this is where you get to know how to secure it and how and, and where are this possible security holes if you do if you're not securing it properly? So we have um, these types of intents. We have explicit and implicit intents. In the explicit intents, um, they are declared like that. Um, intent action intent is is new intent and started explicit with the um, activity's name, with the class name of the activity. Then we have the implicit intents, and with the implicit intents, um, we only have to say, hey, we have an intent that is um, going to do something like this action view, action view is something like um, I have a photo, please show me the photo, who can show me this photo? This is more the broadcast way. The other thing is more a direct way to a special application. For catch, if you want your application to catch intents, to say, um, I, w I can I can show you your picture you're taking. So I will catch every intent that says um, a few. So you can declare this in your manifest like Android intent action few. So this means to the whole system, this application is capable of doing this action. Please, if someone is broadcasting, please do this action. Respond. The broadcast intents normally are used by the Android system ex itself, and it announces certain events, like I told before, Wi-Fi has turned on, SMS incoming, call, something like that. And multiple apps can respond with the action. Like I told before, multiple um, 
if you broadcast every application that is capable of um, showing you an SMS, can say, hey, I will show you, I will show you, I will show you. If this is happening, you will, if you tap to open SMS, you will see more than one button with um, the chance to um, decide which application should now open this for you as a user. This is what you see as a user. So it's a, it's a really good way to um, <laughs> empower the users to um, do the stuff they like with the application they like. Every application can have public and private components. Um, normally, um, if you have components with intense filters, they are normally public. Makes sense. And if you have components without intent filters, they are private. Makes sense too, because nobody wants to talk with someone that can do anything for him. So here you can see this um, is without an intent filter, so it says it is private. Now we go to securing the activities and service. Every activity should be secured um, with its own permission, that it can't, cannot be started by applications that do not have this um, permission or that do not know about this permission either. So this is really important if you don't want your activities to be abused. Please, please, please make it private and add permissions. So this is a very safe way. The same is for um, services that run in background. If you have services running in the background, Please take care that they are secured with um, permissions and that they are secured by being private if they have no need to be not private. It's like I told you, the, le the principle of least privilege. Please don't share data if you don't need to share data. Then we go over to the content providers. Um, content providers um, need read or write permission. So this is, like I told you before, different permissions for reading or writing. If you write, you don't have implicitly a read permission. This is different to a normal Linux system. Please keep that in mind. And so um, as you can see in the manifest file here, I declared the, um, the permission db read and db write for um, writing and reading in the database in, within the content provider. Then the broadcast intents should be secured too. And you can restrict which broadcast receivers are allowed to receive the broadcast with the, with the permission. So you can say um, that only receivers that have the permission something happened to receive or really received this um, broadcast. So your broadcast is not um, broadcasted to everyone. It's only broadcasted to everyone with this permission. So you be aware of um, applications that don't know about this permission, so it's a little more secure. So we can also restrict from whom we accept the broadcasts. Um, and the sender of the broadcast must hold 
a specific permission. This means if the sender of the broadcast has the permission, FUBAR something happened, only then we accept the broadcast from him. We can also declare a receiver with the permission programmatically. I only gave you this snippet to have it in mind if you will need it someday. And um, yeah, securing the application as as a, as the application, the intercomponents of the co uh, the components of the application. Yeah, this means um, both activities. Please decide really, really careful. Who should be able to start them, to stop them, and to bind to them, or to share data with them? The services is the same. And you can add further programmatic checks if you will bind to them or allow apps to make calls or to methods. You can check for this if they are allowed. If you don't check, yeah, they will be allowed eventually. And then it will eventually will have um, some vulnerability you don't expect it. With broadcasts and our intents, please, please, please make sure to secure the senders as well as the receivers. This is the only way to really, really, really um, make sure that no other application can get data out of your own application. So to prevent data leakage, to prevent privacy problems and something like that, please make sure to secure both. So, um, protecting data on the device, stored on the device itself. Here we have uh, some protection principles. Um, and Android comes with a bunch of good cryptographic methods. I think the easiest way to protect data stored on a device that can be lost, that can be corrupted, or something like that. If it is lost, we all know physical, having a physical device is not secure anymore. So everybody, what's, what's doing everybody? Cryptography. And Android comes with a bunch of very good crypt cryptographic methods, and um, I think we should use them. We should never, never, ever write our own crypto cryptography or do something like, yeah, or do something like, yeah, and securing our data with only a weak password or something like that. Then we can do defense and death. This means um, first we secured the application itself. Now we secure the data that is stored. This is a multi-layer thing. And another good point is, yeah, please only store data you really need to store. Data that is not stored on the device can't be lost, can't be corrupted, can't be taken by others that found a phone on the street and wanted to find out who you are or who your friends are. And um, yeah, please choose proper encryption algorithm for your purpose. They should all be computational and feasibility. This means um, our cryptographic algorithms has to get stronger over time because computers are getting much faster over the time. So it is much more, it is easier for weak encryption to get broken than years before. So please keep in mind with this slide that we are talking about on um, data that is stored on the device. So when should I use symmetric encryption? Um, for example, if you store a, a, a password, it has to be transmitted to authenticate a user against a foreign app. So you can't take a hash because you can't um, transmit a hash to, if you write a social media concentrator, for example, where you have um, Google Plus, um, Facebook, Twitter, Sing, LinkedIn, all in one application. You can't take um, a hash to 
Facebook, for example, but you can't take um, the normal password to them, so you need to do symmetric encryption. With hashing and sorting, yeah, if you're if only your app makes use from, from the password or from the hash, you can use this. That's not a problem. If the user has to authenticate on its own app, on its stored on its device, for example, for banking purpose or something like that, then a hash is a good way to restrict usage of this application. And asymmetric key encryption, sorry for that, but I don't have any clue <laughs> why we should um, do it for data stored on the device, not for data in transit. This is a different thing. So here is an example of a key um, derivation algorithm for symmetric encryption. And here you can see um, we have a PBE with a shard 256 and 256 uh, um, bits IS in um, cipher block chaining mode and we iterated 1000 times and the key length is 265 bit so this is a re really strong key this is an example for how to do this with Android um, with, with um, standard Android methods that are delivered with the Android system. So please make sure if you store data on the device to use something like um, this um, key derivation algorithm or something or some others you can find out um, on, the, on the Android developers pages. So um, we have to secure the server interactions too. So um, server, to secure server interactions, everybody of us thinks, I know, I think everybody of us knows um, how it is with, this, with um, securing um, data transmitted to servers or something like that. And um, everybody of, uh, of us knows HTTPS and what it means. So Android comes with a bunch of um, Android comes with a bunch of commercial CAs trusted out of the box, so like Salty or I think Digi not how us want to. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they trust them out of the box and you can use the HTTPS URL connection class. Um, it is derived from directly from the HTTPL, HTTP URL connection class, so you can use it nearly the same way. It's very easy to implement secure transmission of data. You have um, also server verification. You can use hostname verification. What? Where is it coming from? <laughs> yeah. You can also use implement hostname verification to make sure um, that the hostname verifier interface um, ha has allow all hostname verifier, strict hostname verifier, or browser combat hostname verifier. So this is um, allow all hostname verifiers the weakest thing because every hostname would be allowed, and um, strict hostname verifier is a little more strict so you can do something um, it's, so you can specif specify a URL directly like HTTPS osconf.pl and um, for browser compat hostname verifier you can do wildcards too so you can specify HTTPS osconf.pl wildcard then this will match also for the slash en thing or for a subdomain, for example, if you do the white card in front of the OSCON thing. Common errors and how to handle them. Um, common errors is um, the trust in a, server, in a server certificate fails or the host name verifying fails, yeah. What to do? 
don't communicate with the server and never do a fallback on HTTP. If you want your application to do HTTPS because you are transmitting data that should be secured, then it should be secured without excuses. So don't do that ever. Throw an exception, tell a user about that something went wrong, but don't ever fall back to HTTP, please. Um, then you can protect um, data transmitted to private servers. This is, we are writing for a dollar big company an application for Android and the dollar big company has the backend servers in their own. So they have control of both sides of the application and the backend server. That's the difference of now. Um, so we can allow only special certs to be used, only this special cert that that special cert can be self-signed in this case because we control everything. We control the server, we control the certificate, and we can say, okay, only the certificate without excuses can be trusted. So it could, can be self-signed also. As before, um, reject all connections that will undergo our security me mechanisms and in this case you can also use client-side authentication. So other important thing is input validation. Input validation is best done with whitelisting, not with blacklisting, because keeping a blacklist up to date is very hard. You can check for the data type, that the length, the numeric range, the numeric sign, the syntax, and the grammar. And please do not accept illegal input. Um, input validation is very important for every, every, everywhere where the user can give you data. For example, for making, um, yeah, you know, the user can give you data for um, making notes or something like that. The input should be validated. That is not code. So we have the command injection. This is a um, well-known example: is the SQL injection. Everybody knows about it and really important it, uh, it, it is really important to separate commands from data this is um, normally done with parameterized queries like I wrote on here um, so in this case um, you separate the query and the statement with the data so this is a very um, secure way to do this because um, the input the data is not directed, um, is not directly in the command. It is validated before it goes to the command. So um, yeah, rule of thumb: never trust user input. You don't know who the user is. So sum it up: everything you got, to, you should have, you should know. Um, to write more secure, to, secure apps. Um, please keep in mind the Android security model because the Android security model is very, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. It's more than one can um, take in 20 minutes or something like that. But please keep in mind because if you know the security model, you can um, write working applications within this security model without um, breaking out for some reason you don't know. Secure application components, as I told you, and there are a lot of more ways to secure it. It is all only an introduction, yeah? Um, please keep in mind the principle of least privilege. Protect your data stored on the device. There are not that much ways, but there are that much algorithms to do that. Please. Use crypto if you store data on the device and only store data you really, really, really need to store. Protect application data in transit. You know, the internet is a wide, wide open network. Everybody can read everything if you use HTTP, but nobody should read your stuff if you use HTTPS. So please secure your data in transit so that every user input, every data the user provides you, and every user credentials 
um, remains private. This is very important. And next thing is never trust you then, but you will never know who is the guy on the other side of the network. Um, yeah, as I told you, I have uh, we, we've done research, and from this we have uh, some tools where you can check your apps, your self-written applications or apps that you want to install. This is the mobile sandbox. This is analyzing Android applications for malicious behavior. You can upload it there. It's very easy. Upload, wait, get a report. The SAAF. This is an Android analysis framework for Smiley code. This is more for um, real malware or real application um, stuff if you want to have an audit or something like that. And ADL is an um, Android data extractor light. Um, this is normally used for forensics. If you're interested in the tools or in the research itself about this, um, please go to our MobWarm blog at blog.mobwarm.de. And if you will reach me, you can reach me there or ask me for a card. I have some cards with me. And thank you for listening. I hope you, I, it was not too much in this short time because I really, really compressed everything. I hope that I didn't leave out too much because yeah, it's a, it's a real big topic. I could talk about it for four days, five days. I can give you a whole day workshop about this topic because that's that much. But now we have only one hour, so I have to quit. Do you have any questions? Please ask. Thank you. Really? No, no questions? Oh, this is a yeah. You you're talking about a big problem, I think, because um, um, currently I have the feeling for myself that I don't. If I if I go to the market to the Play Store and download an application, sometimes I don't check the permissions properly. I know that I don't do this, and I know that this is not good that I don't do this. But, but I think this is um, like like um, ten years ago with Windows. Further, further, okay, further, further. Nobody was reading what was, was that, what was standing there while installing some stuff. So I think this is, um, yeah, a desensibilization of the user because the user is always thinking, yeah, okay, I have to accept this and then, can, then I can use this application. But yeah. There you're right, but I think this is the best approach they could do because um, some users will look at it. And even if nobody is looking every time at it, you can rate the applications in the Play Store. And if some applications only have one star or non star or only two stars, you, you, you really automatically get to look, oh, what's wrong with this application? And then you found if we will find comments like it's crashing, it's suspicious, it's doing strange things in the background or something like that, and then you know, okay, I don't, I don't want to install it. So, I think I think it's a good approach um, to gather the permissions and the community thing in the Play Store. Only one of these both wouldn't work. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can achieve this with um, declaring a permission, a private permission that nobody knows for your application component that is using this and assigning the data only to this component. So this is possible.
Okay, first, I do not work for a German government. I work for a company in Germany, an yes, um, offensive security company in Germany. Um, and only the research project I work with in is um, funded by a government organization. But the only thing they have to do with us is giving us money, and once in a year we have to bring them a report what we are doing. So <laughs> I'm not working for the government first. Um, yeah. I am using my Android device. Hmm. How do I use it? I don't have any special applications installed or something like that. Um, because I I know how I can do reverse engineering on Android. I know how to analyze malware on Android. So what I really do is with um, sensitive applications is that I check them before I install them. This is what I what I do, not more. Or sometimes I ask um, a good friend of mine or some other guys in the project, hey, you're using this. Have you ever checked it? And if they say, tell me, yeah, I checked it. It's quite OK to do so. Then I will install it without um, further looking at it. So. Okay, um, the problem with anti-malware software, as we all know, is the heuristics. Um, we have the heuristics, and the heuristics only tell me if they know about some malicious app. They know about some special behavior of malicious apps. If I write a new malicious app that is, com that is behaving completely different with other methods, with other, yeah, for example, Exactly, this will not be detected for a while. I think for the normal uh, end user, like my mother or my father or my brother, they don't have anything to do with IT. It is okay for their own feeling of security to have installed Lookout Security Mobile Checker or Semantics Checker or something like that. They have, yeah. And I think if you are using third party markets very often, it is very helpful to have something like that because if you download the application it will be installed initially so if you have um, a listener that is listening to um, system events and then start the application you don't have any option to not start the application it will start so I think this is a good way for a normal user that don't have the awareness about malicious applications to use this, but it shouldn't be the only mechanism to lean on. This is, yeah, I think this is, um, yeah. For me, it makes not that much sense, I think, um, but for normal users. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Um, I, um, my father is, looking the, uh, is using the lookout thing, and this is a little better. Um, he's, um, every time he downloads an application from a website, from the market, or from, from, from some third sort of party market, well, because a good friend of him told him to, this, to do this, it, it is checking the app before it is installing it. And if it is finding some or heuristic in your application, it will tell you and ask you, should I really, really install it? Um, I think I found this malicious application within your application. I think um, for people like my father or normal users, it's, it's a good way, but yeah, we all know it's um, a little pointless on the other hand. <laughs> So I guess that's it. Yeah, that's it. And I think everybody should go to have a break after this intense talk. Yeah, we are going to have uh, a lunch break right now until uh, 1.30. Uh, so see you back then. Uh, but first, uh, you can come over here uh, on the front and take some uh, things from our uh, sponsors or, and uh, uh, partners, like uh, uh, this little uh, notebooks and some other stuff. 
so offensive program uh, off offensive uh, security right yeah. it's it's like klingon security i, <laughs> I told that uh, yesterday find out where you where, where your com combat has the weakest part of its body and then <laughs> that's right so uh, thank you and see you uh, at 1:30